This is a pretty intense scene. It's a pretty intense burn. There's a significant amount of heat right here. So I can, I can definitely see why folks are afraid of this. It seems our modern instinct when it comes to fire is fear. Catastrophic wildfires out west cause indescribable devastation, including human and wildlife deaths and ecosystem impacts that will last centuries. Our approaches to managing these natural disasters provoke debate and solutions span the political spectrum. For example, aggressive fire suppression inadvertently built up fuels in the forest, further intensifying fires like the ones we've been experiencing lately. But on the other hand, nobody wants smoke-filled springs even when we know that smoke is doing good. I'm here at Tall Timbers to learn about prescribed fire and how this ancient and natural tool, when used frequently, can turn fire from a problem to a solution. On top of that, I want to reap some of these rewards by going after my first eastern turkey, which, by the way, is a ground nesting bird. Can we really fight fire with fire? Frequent burns in this area keep the right balance of grasses, forbs, shrubs, small hardwoods, creating habitat for insects and animals like turkeys that eat those insects. If burned correctly, even the tick-filled forests of northern Florida are a pleasurable place to be. Well, we got our burn crew over here. We're hit at the shop, they're getting all the equipment together, a couple four-wheelers, burn pots. Damn, why are you burning this stuff? So the whole 3,000 acres of burning we do here on this property is patch burned for wildlife management. And do I get a light anything on fire? You're welcome to. Sweet. Sweet. Absolutely right. Perfect. Uh, I'm in. The more certs, the better. <laughs> all right. It smells like barbecue in here. But, you know, you're aware that People who are in fire have the reputation for really liking fire too, right? You know, that's my favorite part of my job, no question about it. What do you do here, Eric? Uh, I'm the land manager and resource coordinator here at Tall Timbers. I take care of the woods for ground cover to produce quality wildlife and diversity. The so burning is very important to maintaining the ecological diversity here in the Red Hills. Uh, not just burning, but frequent fire. So we burn most of Tall Timbers on average every other year on a two-year rotation. This is your power. Okay. Put that on, watch out, Bill. Yep. And then uh, this is your, kind of how much, how much fuel is going to get let out to so this mixture of diesel and gasoline. So we just strip that out, light it, and give it. So I cranked it a little bit, so you can play with that if you want to, how far you shoot it. You're going to have to go a little slow. Sometimes it goes out, so if it goes if, it, if the fire's not growing, just sl um, slow down and it'll catch back up again. Okay. I'm not gonna lie, the kid in me was very happy to be driving a fire-breathing four-wheeler. The fact that it serves an ecological benefit is a nice bonus. Okay, you guys have been running around like crazy, or your team's been running around like crazy. Uh, and from what I'm seeing, like you're kind of making a box with the fire, using using the wind. That's exactly right. Started out with the back and fire, and we took a bunch of strips in there and burned that out so we get black. And now we know we're safe enough to start pulling the sides, which are the flank fires, and then ultimately we'll put the head fire onto it. 
Okay, so is this clean enough for you? Even though there's kind of this little fingerling hardwood type stuff coming up? Right, here? so there's some stuff back in the background that's still green. But what's happened is when that fire came through at the ground level and burned up those fine fuels, it boiled the vascular cambium, which are the veins, if you will, in the plant that are transporting nutrients and water up and down from the root system to the leaves. We've boiled that in the burn, and so that uh, plant is effectively top killed. The plant itself is not dead, but everything above ground has been top killed. Is right, gone. so whatever root system So the root that system will has. then set up a new set of uh, sprouts to to become the tree. Gotcha, and then run around the whole time and, and making sure like these little runners don't. Yeah, well, you have part of your crew's ignition, and I'm doing most of that today, but the other part of the crew is the holding crew, and they'll continue to come back and check uh, the perimeter to make sure everything's on the up and up. So you see how this tree's really arced over, and it actually goes over the fire break. See, you guys set the back burn on, and this is a damaged tree, and as that sap seeps out trying to heal the tree, the fire's going up there because that stuff's really flammable, and it's racing up the tree, and it could go over and deep into the section of timber that they're trying to protect. So that's why these guys are on the ground uh, hosing it down and trying to stop that fire from carrying over the fire line. So this is pretty wild. I mean, we this was raging fire mm -hmm. 20 minutes ago, maybe, right? Yeah. Um, there's still some some snags you can hear the, the crew kind of putting out over there, but it's, it's done. pretty darn clean. Done, clean. And, uh, you know, you and I are standing in here, no heat, a little bit of residual smoke. That's why I say within literally minutes, the wildlife start moving back in. The ones that didn't leave and didn't go underground to escape it. Turkeys, quail, songbirds, they're all right back here now. And they're yeah, feeding on stuff. There's a uh, spiral of vultures. <laughs> yeah. The studies have found that very few actual mortalities of individuals in these types of situations. Because, you know, it, it really didn't, it moved fast through their stand, but they can hear it coming from a mile away. So they start moving ahead of it. Yeah, it's, it's a light jogging pace on a day like today. Yeah. This is not a 50 mile an hour grass fire or something crazy wildfire. You know yeah. what I'm saying? This is a controlled burn. And, yeah. Uh, done safely with a crew of four people and and you well, lighting five, the fire. Five. Yeah, 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 absolutely five. five. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't downgrade me, Bill. Well, you're a burner now. Oh yeah, man, I mean, it's it's gratifying. You make like this nice, nice clean line up here. And the neat thing about it is, is that you're managing an ecosystem this way. You're benefiting wildlife and you're actually benefiting the plants that you wouldn't you wouldn't think you were, but you absolutely are because the ones that are adapted to fire are gonna thrive. My question is always like, is this scalable? Sure. Right, can you take this and take it someplace else? Obviously that's what you guys do, yeah. but is it like a what's good for turkeys in Florida is it gonna be good for turkeys in Montana? That's the question that people have finally come around to is realizing that in the Red Hills and Florida and Georgia, this is kind of like the gold standard of fire use. And elements of this are going to end up being copied all over the country because it is the right way to do it. The right way to do it may sound a little bold, but you can analyze the growth rings on a hundred year old tree just about anywhere in the country and see that fire was much more common on the landscape until us computerized humans came along. It's my first morning of turkey season. I'm in Florida, very close to the Georgia border, and uh, the woods are alive. It is <laughs> incredibly loud. Life everywhere. Right now, waiting for the first gobble of the day in a spot I've never been. High hopes. Okay, there's a gobble way over here. Without 
knowing exactly where I'm at. Kind of on a ridge top. Rolls off pretty significantly into some darker timber. And that's where the, the gobble's coming from. So I'm gonna try a little call here. Let's see if we get a response. Birds are getting close this way. say, I don't know, if she came into the calling, or this is just on her route, I'd be willing to call it a real success if it was a gobbler coming in, gobbling every time I called, but that's not happening. I just don't know where these birds are in their season, so they could be following hands. And then when she lays down on a nest, then they stop following her and start looking for other hands that are more receptive, which is then when they become very killable. Feels good though. Being a spot that a turkey wants to come through or is willing to, so. Just give her more time. As my old, old buddy Jim says, kill turkeys with your ass, not with your feet. I'm just starting to see him coming in on the same line as that hand was. Unfortunately, the hen that came through earlier, she was on the same approach. And then when she bugged out, she came through this little opening over here. So I kind of took note of that escape route and figured he'd do the same thing if he got nervous, which he did. Probably because he could hear my heart beating. This is uh, the first real Eastern bird I've ever gotten. And it may have happened fast enough to where I don't have any ticks, which would be like a new world record for me. Easiest way for me to differentiate an Eastern from the Rios, which are real common in Montana, is this super dark tail fan. There's no white stripe at the top. A nice real bronze, iridescent coloring. Super pretty bird. So the recreational part of the day is over. You're allowed one turkey per day, 
total of two per season in Florida. I'm gonna go meet up with Bill. And one of the main things I'm interested in is how fire interacts with these birds because these big birds are ground nesters. Birds can fly, eggs cannot. We're standing in the famous uh, Stoddard plots. They, these are sets of plots on the property that represent different burn frequencies. So this plot has been burned every single year since 1960. And then we have plots that have been burned every two years since 1960, every three years, every four years. So that, that zone where I shot that bird. Yeah, what, what that would be that? about a two year fire frequency. We have, as you can see on this habitat, since it's burned every year, you got very little hardwood stems. There's still hardwoods here, but they may be 70 years old, but they're only about that tall. Okay. They just re-sprout. So that leaves a lot of space for your grasses and forbs to come in and a tremendous amount of biodiversity. So if you're a turkey with pulse, you're going to come in here and bug. When this thing gets up all green and insects everywhere, a lot more plant diversity here. As you increase fire frequency going from every year to say every two years, every three years, every four years, you quickly start losing the forb and grass component, the weed and grass component, and uh, you start getting just shrub coverage. And that's just uh, kills habitat quality for quail, turkeys, deer, you name it. Cause, just because they don't like walking through it or why? Well, yeah, it's kind of that. It's not fun to walk through one, but uh, main thing is it doesn't produce much food. Hmm. You know, hardwood re-sprouts, you know, water oak, hickory, sweet gum, all these plants, they don't, when they're this tall or 20 feet tall, they don't really produce any food. And then they shade out everything on the ground and you just, you lose your ecosystem. So maybe what Bill means is work with nature instead of fighting it. Wildlife and landscapes across our country have been adapted to fire. People and even animals have benefited from the prime hunting opportunities fire creates. There is no question that prescribed burns are an antidote for the mega fires of the West. The real question is, can education override fear and will our social tolerance for smoke allow for the use of fire as a management tool?